And now, Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. We'll be investing $20 million to assist in the strengthening and the expansion of Jamaica's commerce in a way that we fully intend will have an impact in strengthening the economy um, of Jamaica. We are announcing today also that we will assist Jamaica in COVID recovery um, by assisting in terms of the recovery efforts in Jamaica that have been essential to, I believe, what is necessary to strengthen not only uh, the, the, the issue of public health, but also the economy. This has been Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. BlazeTV.com slash Stu is the place to go to get your subscription to Blaze TV. Use the code Stu to save 10 bucks. Madeline Kearns with a new Women's Bill of Rights is on the way today. Controversy at the Grammys. And we start by doing supreme idiocy. Uh, the, the vote is coming up. And it's not going to be a surprise. We've been telling you about this from the beginning. You don't get positive surprises. Have you not learned that yet? At some point, do you not learn that good things don't happen in these regards? That's just not what goes on here. Like, there's an op-ed today. Could Katanji Brown-Jackson be pro-life? No, she cannot be. Because that would be wonderful news, and it's just not going to occur. So you can just push that one behind you. No, don't hold your breath. Not going to happen. There's this idea that because she seemed to sound a a tad bit originalist during her answers, that she might just be an originalist. She is not. A bunch of liberals did not gather together to pick someone who was pro-life. This I promise you. Remember, they had other choices here. It was the hardcore left that wanted Katanji Brown Jackson. She is not going to disappoint the left. This never happens to the left with Supreme Court picks. You know, the right, we're like, oh, gosh, let's just pick that person. I don't really want to know what they really think. Let's not ask them any tough questions. Let's just pick that person, look at their smiling face, and then they spend 30 years on the bench disagreeing with every conservative position. This is the way this works for the right, and the opposite is the way it works for the left. Don't expect good things, and you won't be disappointed. And that's the thing, I think, that maybe wraps our head around today's monologue. What are we looking for? in a senator, in a Supreme Court justice, in a politician, in a leader. What are we looking for exactly? Normally, we're looking for massive disappointment. At least that's what we get all the time, and it's expected. Now, if you happen to be uh, checking out this particular program, we told you right at the beginning, you are not gonna get a real fight from the Republicans on this nominee. Of course, you have the first black female nominee, and there's a bunch of Republicans who just don't want to be tough on the first black female nominee. Is that embarrassing? Yeah. Is it kind of racist? Yeah. You should treat everybody equally. You shouldn't worry about their skin color. But Republicans didn't want to look mean, so they weren't going to go all out. On the other hand, they also would argue, and this is correct, they couldn't block it anyway. They couldn't do anything anyway, so we might as well just utilize this for the best possible path for politics. And that's what a lot of them did. A lot of them just sat back and didn't do much of anything. And there has been very little drama. Now, it's fascinating to watch the media's reaction to this. The media is saying things like, this is even worse than the Kavanaugh hearings. Did we accuse her of rape at any point? I I don't remember doing that. It's possible. I I don't remember. I don't remember even asking her whether she drank a lot back in high school. I don't remember any of the types of questions I've seen for any Justice. I don't remember any of it going on. And look, I'd rather be on the side of the aisle that has some sort of principle and standard. I know I know it's out of fashion now. It's no longer the thing you're supposed to do. But I kind of still like it. Call me old fashioned on that one. Call me, uh, you know, call me crazy. Call me wacky. 
So we have this situation that has developed where Ketanji Brown Jackson is going to be the next Supreme Court justice. We know this is going to happen. There's nothing the Republicans can do. And honestly, even if they could do something, they probably wouldn't do it. That's the way that this works. But there are some people who step up and they lead the pack in ways it's hard to understand and explain. We have some votes that are just even worse than the rest of them. And today I'd like to feature just a few. For example, a dishonorable mention in this category goes to Lindsey Graham. Yes, the one, the only Lindsey Graham. And you might say, well, Lindsey Graham, he's voting no on Ketanji Brown Jackson. And that is supposedly technically true. I never believe I, I wouldn't be surprised if six months later he comes back and changes his vote. But he's saying he's going to vote no on Ketanji Brown Jackson. So why would he be one of the worst votes? Well, let's be honest about it. When no one was watching, he voted for Ketanji Brown Jackson at her last gig, uh, for, of her federal court gig. So he was fine when nobody was paying attention uh, to vote. Go, Yeah, sure, whatever, put her through. It's now she's going to the Supreme Court when everyone's looking at your vote on the right that he's now voting the quote unquote right way. But we should point out that he's only voting the right way because he had a relationship with one of the other finalists. Judge Childs, who's from his state, South Carolina, he argued on television passionately on her behalf, saying that he would vote for her immediately and that he would, they would get lots of Republican votes if a South Carolina uh, candidate was the one that was picked. Then when it wasn't the one that was picked, he got mad. And so he's now decided that he's going to vote against Ketanji Brown Jackson. This is typical Lindsey Graham. And Lindsey Graham is just one of these guys. He does this over and over and over and over again. Was he good in the Kavanaugh hearings? Well, sure, he was okay in the Kavanaugh hearings. But he does not know. I mean, he does it when he knows it will help donations come in, when he can try to put himself on the grandstand a little bit more for a couple more days. But that's the way Lindsey Graham operates. And I don't know. doesn't fool me. I don't know if it fools you. Maybe it does. He's everybody's buddy when he has to be. But the bottom line is he goes the wrong way more often than not. And in this case, it's hard to give him any credit for his no vote. All right. Bronze medal goes to Susan Collins. Now, Susan Collins is one of the yes votes. She was the first one to announce she was a yes vote, and she gets the bronze medal for the worst vote on Katanji Brown Jackson. And why does she get the bronze medal? Well, she, of the yes votes here, is the most understandable. And here's why. First of all, she's basically a Democrat anyway. Every once in a while, she votes the right way on something. It's rare, but it does occur. She does have, uh, we were looking at the conservative review uh, scores today. They have the freedom uh, score. And I believe hers was 20%. Now, Joe Manchin is the most conservative Democrat, and he's at 18. So they're basically the same person. Manchin and Collins are basically the same person. And y y look, you, you understand why she would vote yes here. They're voting the same way, by the way, Manchin and Collins, on this particular issue. Now, in some ways, uh, the, the politics of the situation actually help Susan Collins here because she's from a blue state, maybe a little purplish at times, but a, mainly a blue state of Maine. And for her to get reelected and stay in the Senate and have a 20% uh, freedom score as opposed to a 0% freedom score, you can see why a vote like this might actually help her in the end. So I can handle Susan Collins. I can wrap my mind around Susan Collins. She's a terrible Republican, but she's in a place where we're lucky to have a terrible Republican, probably. So we give her only the bronze medal for her terrible yes vote. Second, with the silver medal, Lisa Murkowski. Now, Lisa is, a, is an odd bird. Lisa Murkowski, very famous family in the state of Alaska. She famously in the Tea Party wave back in the day lost her primary to a Tea Party candidate who would have been much more conservative and you'd think you'd have a conservative candidate win in a red state like Alaska. However, Murkowski's name recognition is so strong she was actually able to pull off what I think is perhaps the most stunning thing I've ever seen in politics in a statewide election since I've been following it, which was lose a primary and then run as a write-in candidate and win a statewide election as a write-in candidate. That is hard to do. 
Uh, she did it, and she's maintained her role as a Republican-ish senator. Now, she's a pre Republican now. She's running in the primary again, and she has an election coming up. And this is why this one's the opposite of Susan Collins. This vote is going to hurt her in uh, Alaska. If someone can defeat her, they will be using this vote in ads. The issue here, though, is Lisa Murkowski is just pretty liberal when it comes to this stuff. She's going to go along. She's, first of all, pro-choice, so she's going to, you know, the abortion stuff doesn't bother her. And she's going to go along and, and vote with particularly female nominees almost at every turn. I mean, really, that's just the way she does it. Uh, she's going to roll that way. And uh, her vote actually could damage her po politics, so at least maybe there's a little bit of principle there. You maybe give her a little bit of credit. I don't know. It's hard, it's hard to, to find a good case here for Lisa Murkowski, but it's kind of expected to. Alaska should do a better job putting someone in office who will actually have some conservative principles. This is Alaska. There's no reason to tolerate Lisa Murkowski. If Murkowski was in Maine, if Murkowski was in Massachusetts, we might say, OK, you know, Lisa Murkowski kind of sucks, but I can deal with it. That's not the case here. She's in Alaska, and then Alaska really should do better, and they deserve better. But the worst vote, without question, there is, it's not a competition. This is like Leah Thomas in a swim meet, okay? Lapping the field over and over and over again. The gold medal goes to Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney, for so many reasons, wins the gold here. Let me give you just a couple. Number one, he's from freaking Utah. So everything I just said about Mur Murkowski, it's times 10. You can have Mike freaking Lee in Utah. Mike Lee. He's like the best senator in the Senate. You can have him, and instead you have Mitt Romney. Now, I know his name is very popular, but that's a problem. We'll get into that here in a second. The other part of this that makes it even worse than Murkowski besides the fact that Utah should be even easier to get a good senator than even Alaska. But the, the, the problem with Romney more than any other person here is, yes, of course, he lets down conservatives all the time. We understand that. Uh, yes, he's in a big, bright red state. We get that. But here's the thing. Mitt Romney, when no one was looking, back when they were voting for her as a federal judge, voted against her. And now he's flip-flopped when it's a higher, more prominent role, when it's a role that matters even more, and now, very important, the spotlight is on, now Mitt Romney is approving her to go to the Supreme Court. It's the reverse of Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham wants to run. He wants, he wants to hide from the spotlight with what he actually believes. Mitt Romney, on the other hand, didn't think she was qualified just a few months ago. And now thinks she's qualified for an even higher level gig because, he's, because he knows people are looking. And he, he's the type of guy who loves to sit in the adoration of places like the New York Times, like MSNBC. He loves it. He sits back there and he enjoys the fact that he's the good Republican. He's the, the uh, I was going to use a reference that I'm glad I didn't use. Uh, he's the good Republican. He's the one that is always there. He's the understandable one. Some of these people are crazy. Mike Lee's crazy. I know he's from my state, but he's nutty. I, I'm the good one. You can count on me. A lot of times this happened with people who goes through, go through this national media spot like, like Romney did in 2012. And it, it happened with McCain, who was kind of like that anyway. But he loved the adoration. He loved the big warm hug of the Washington Post. And now he'll get it. He'll be the adult in the room, and everyone will say what a good guy he is, just like his impeachment vote, just like 25 other things you can point to. Uh, Mitt Romney is the guy who's going to get all the love and adoration from the press for his really warm vote. That means, of course, nothing. She was going to get through anyway. And if you really believe she is, uh, she's good enough to be a Supreme Court justice, surely your vote was a massive mistake just a few months ago when you voted against her. Look, the truth is, I don't expect much out of Washington. I don't expect perfection. I can even live with some pretty mediocre Republicans in blue states. Susan Collins blows, but I can live with her sucking considering she's from Maine. But Mitt Romney, it's just inexcusable.
You should be able to take the Constitution to a scientist who can electrify it and gene splice it with a human being and make the perfect senator in a lab. It's freaking Utah. And I might add, that scenario might just be what happened in the case of Mike Lee. Just throwing it out there. If you can get Mike Lee elected in your state, you don't need Mitt Romney. As governor of Massachusetts, Romney might be fine. But a senator in the brightest of red states, are you kidding me? He's an absolute embarrassment. We declared our independence from the king for a lot of really good reasons. But one near the top of the list is that we didn't like the idea of a king. We didn't want royalty. We didn't want a family to grab and hold on to power forever simply based on their name. Now, I know the Romney name is well known in Utah. I get it. But he should have never been able to be elected as senator in the first place. And he should be sent home in the first available primary. Oh, and I suppose it's possible Mitt Romney suddenly discovers the conservative principles he's been looking for all of these many, many years. But like the possibility of Katanji Brown Jackson being pro-life, I wouldn't hold your breath. This spring, you can revamp your daily routine with Bespoke Post and their new seasonal lineup of must-have box of awesome collections. Bespoke Post partners with small businesses and emerging, emerging brands to bring you the most unique goods every month. No matter what you have going on this season, Box of Awesome has you covered. From camping gear essentials to cookout must-haves uh, like hot sauces, barbecue rubs, Box of Awesome has collections for every part of your life. You know what I have? I, I got this awesome travel bag from Box of, uh, Box of Awesome. It's really cool. Also got an axe because I'm a man and now I have an axe to chop things. I don't know what I'm chopping with that axe, but I've got an axe just in case I need to chop something like you to get started. You can take the quiz at boxofawesome.com. Your answers will help them pick the right box of awesome for you. They release new boxes every month across a ton of different categories, and each box is valued at around $70. I can tell you just the axe by itself is worth more than that. It's really, really cool. Uh, plus, uh, and you, you pay only a, a fraction of that price. Uh, and with each box of awesome, you're supporting small business. 90% of everything that comes in your box of awesome is from a small up-and-coming brand. you got to get in on this. It's a great gift as well. Free to sign up. You can skip a month uh, at any time, or you can just cancel if you want. But I don't think you're going to want you're gonna want to do that. You're going to like this stuff. You get 20% off right now your first monthly box when you sign Sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter the code STU at checkout. It's boxofawesome.com. Code is STU uh, for 20% off your first box. Boxofawesome.com. Code STU. It's great to welcome Madeline Kearns back to the program. She's a staff writer for National Review and visiting fellow for the Independent Women's Forum, whose sister organization has recently put out the Women's Bill of Rights, which I'll tweet a link out to here shortly. You can sign your support as well. Madeline, good to see you again. Thanks for coming back on. Thanks for having me. Uh, can we start in Florida here? Uh, we've been talking a lot about the what has uh, unfortunately been called the Don't Say Gay bill. Um, and this bill is actually really popular among uh, people in Florida. Uh, this is something that has been kind of pushed down by the media. But one of the things that I don't think has had enough attention here is how it relates to um, there's a, a clause in the bill that basically says you can't hide this stuff from parents. You can't, you you know, we have a a friend who is in a school district where uh, they had uh, one of the teachers keeping clothing for various genders in the classroom in case there was a transgender child who wanted to come in, lie to their parents, come in dressed as one sex and change to the other. And part of this bill kind of says, hey, you can't do that anymore. How important is that part of the bill? It's absolutely critical. And of course, it's been completely overlooked by the people saying this is all about not saying the word gay, of course the gay, the word gay does not even appear in the bill's text. But you've you've honed in on something really, really important here. And that's that parents have the right to direct the medical care and psychological care of their own children. That is not a radical statement, that should be uncontroversial. That right is based in the Constitution in the 14th Amendment. It is years and years of legal precedent. Um, And actually, if anything, Florida's bill could have been even more um, aggressively worded. All it did was say, you're not allowed to hide this from parents. You're not allowed to refuse to give them medical records and mental health records of their own child if they ask for it. 
they could have put in the, the Bills drafters could have put in a affirmative duty. They could have said, you must always disclose everything you're doing with somebody else's child, which I think is the next step, to be honest, because this is largely a defensive bill. And that's what's been lost in a lot of the coverage. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I, are you at all surprised, uh, just speaking away from the right and wrong of this issue for a moment and just going to pure politics, are you at all surprised after what we saw in Virginia, where Terry McAuliffe is on stage saying, ah, parents really shouldn't have a hand in their education, and it costs them a really a blue, but maybe a little purple state like Virginia, that this is their battle. I mean, this is even going farther than McAuliffe uh, did. This idea that parents should not be involved at all, that kids should be able to have conversations about sex and gender transformation and transition uh, when they're in second grade, this is the hill the Democrats are choosing to die on in an election where they're already going uphill quite a bit. Yeah, I think obviously the people who are pushing this policy and, and drafting this policy clearly don't have children or don't understand children. I think regardless of what your politics are, people instinctively instinctively know that topics such as sexuality and transgenderism are not things that under eight-year-olds really need to be thinking about. Uh, these are highly complicated adult themes. And that is very clear in the polling. Um, one poll showed that 55% of Democrats agree that this sh stuff shouldn't be in the classroom. So you're absolutely right. It's a losing battle, which again is, I think, why they've had to lie about it and pretend that it's about not, not acknowledging gay people or something when it's not about that at all. It's about things that are pretty common sense and bipartisan. Mm. That brings me to the Women's Bill of Rights. You guys have put this out and it's pretty interesting in that I think last time you were on, I asked you to define what a woman was. You were somehow able to do that and very quickly. It was incredible. Uh, but that's kind of a big part of this is just like, let's set a baseline here so we understand what we're talking about when we talk about women, when we talk about men, when we talk about women's sports, for example. Can you explain what the goal of this was? Yeah, absolutely. So for the last 50, 60, 70 years, there have been numerous laws passed um, to protect women's sex-based rights. So Title IX was, was an example of, of one of those laws. And if we are to subtly redefine what sex means, as the Democrats would like to do, to include this concept of gender identity, that basically renders all sex-based rights and protections meaningless. And so what the Bill, Women's Bill of Rights would do is it would codify women as a, a distinct legal category. It would define what those basic biological concepts are, such as man, woman, male, female. Of course, it shouldn't be necessary to do this, but unfortunately, given the aggression from the left, it is necessary to do this. Yeah, it, it really is, because it doesn't seem like anybody even understands what these words mean, even Supreme Court justice nominees. Um, and, and you see these sort of, I'm fascinated by this, the way these narratives sort of collide in an intersection. We have, you know, we're seeing this in Ukraine and all the terrible news that's coming out of Ukraine. One of the underlying storylines has been this idea that people who are trans in Ukraine, maybe a woman who has transitioned to a man, has decided they want to leave the country and they're getting stopped at the border because men are not allowed to leave the country. And this is being promoted in America as some unfair uh, targeting of, of trans people. And it, look, given the scope of what's going on over there, it's a minor uh, part of the story, but it is fascinating in that they can't seem to keep the story straight. They can't seem to keep all the cars from crashing into each other inside of this intersection. Yeah, I think the, the truth of the matter is that most people don't really care about transgenderism. They're not really very interested if a certain man wants to dress a certain way or be called something. That's, that's fine. Nobody really cares. And certainly nobody really cares during a war. I mean, talk about narcissism. People have bigger problems in that context than whether or not somebody gets to use this restroom or, or whether or not somebody's going to be addressed in a certain way. And you absolutely identified what really went on there. It's, it's not about the individual identifying as transgender. That's irrelevant. Nobody really cares. It's about what, what sex are you? And war is a great example of where we recognize sex differences. 
males are are better suited to combat than females because they are they are stronger, they're faster, um, they have more aggression because of testosterone. I mean, this is why since the beginning of time we have always had men on the battlefield and not women. Of course, with the modernization of warfare, that has changed slightly. But that general principle of acknowledging differences between the sexes applies and transcends any concept of gender theory that we may have cooked up in Western academies. Yeah, seems. I think anything uh, on this front uh, has to look crazy to a, a big chunk of the world as you're seeing all this stuff go on that's so serious. Um, let me bring you over to Disney here for a second, uh, as we've seen these videos that have leaked out from these behind the scenes. Um, um, I, I don't know, I guess it was a company-wide meeting, so it wasn't all that behind the scenes. Uh, but the idea that there there is this I mean, to me, somewhat stunning uh, admissions from executives inside of Disney talking about how um, 50 percent of their material is going to be LGBTQ, how they are they have a program that somehow identifies how many background characters are, are, are of all these different groups. This company seems to have completely abandoned what I thought its goal was, which was to entertain children in sort of a wholesome way, and has now moved into complete agenda stuff that they're now admitting on camera. I mean, it really is stunning to watch this, the, the fall of what I think people thought Disney was. Absolutely. I mean, parents want to, to put on something that their child can enjoy. They don't, they don't want to have to be dealing with somebody else's concept of an ideological playground. They don't want somebody trying to bring in controversial adult ideas to their child at, at a young age. I mean, that's that's not why that's not why parents put on the, the TV for their kids. That's not why they go to Disney World. Um, and I think th this should, again, this is something that isn't necessarily just a, a right wing issue. I think all parents can recognize that and don't want these types of materials pushed on their children, especially behind their backs in sneaky, covert ways. Uh, let me give you one more here before we, uh, we before we go to break. Um, there's the new Oklahoma passed a law today, um, which but basically outlaw abortion. We're seeing a lot of this going going on in red states around the country. We know we have uh, this big Supreme Court uh, decision coming up uh, as it regards uh, as it relates to the Mississippi law. Do you have an idea of how all this stuff is going to turn out? What do you see happening here? And do you think, I mean, is there an argument to be made? And I've heard this argument made. Uh, culturally, this is going to be a big identifying movement. If they overturn abortion, is this something that affects the election? And does that even matter? So it's it's interesting because it's hard to get the impression of um, how big this is of an issue outside sort of the people who cover it most in the media. Mm. Um of course, the, the the issue about Roe versus Wade and, and overturning it would be, would this be a matter for states to decide? Um, and I think that that's going to play out very differently in different states. So I think we'll just have to wait and see. But I, I think that those who think that everybody feels the same way as, as progressive journalists and, and politicians might be in for a surprise. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, it is shocking. I do see this as the type of thing, though, that that media that you spoke of is going to make into a massive issue as we lead into the election. This is this is their pitch to say, this is Gilead, this is Handmaid's Tale, everyone's going to be wearing a red robe soon, women aren't going to be allowed out of the house. This pitch is coming uh, from the media and the left as we approach the election, but I, I, I'm i skeptical as if, I don't see think it's going to work. I think in this type of environment with inflation and all these other major issues, people are, are going to be focusing on those things. What do you think? Yeah, I, th I think inflation is always going to be the, the number one thing because that's the thing that most directly affects most people's lives. They can tell when the gas prices are going up. They can tell when rent prices are going up. That is something they get very angry and frustrated about. So I think that's definitely going to be uh, one of the, the main issue, to be honest. There are other issues, and, and of course the left loves to always hype up that, that conservatives are the aggressors in the culture war. But actually, as we've seen with the overreach with transgenderism, I think there's a pretty good case for, for making it clear that actually the progressives are the aggressors here. Yeah, uh, it certainly seems that way to me. Uh, Madeline, how do people get involved with the Women's Bill of Rights? Can they support it in some way? Yeah, so you can go online uh, to independentwomensvoice.org and you'll find the, the women's bills rights there and you can you can sign the petition to show your support and we're hoping that um, it'll get picked up in, in all 50 states. Mm. Madeline Kern, staff writer for National Review. Be sure to check out the Women's Bill of Rights from the Independent, uh, Independent Women's Voice. Uh, I'll, I'll tweet it out as well uh, from at Student Does America. Madeline, thanks so much for coming on the program. I appreciate it.
Thanks for having me. Well, we have a civilization that's essentially run by Twitter, which is a particularly poor way to run a civilization. We had this uh, back and forth. Joe Walsh tweeted, Tucker Carlson tonight, quote, what if these bodies of tortured dead civilians were staged? What if they're fake? What if the Ukrainian military killed them and then blamed Russia? I'm not saying any of this is true. I'm just asking the questions. Why can't we ask these questions? And, you know, a sitting uh, congressman, Adam Kinzinger, uh, responded, I got to say, if Tucker Carlson is not a Russian asset, he should be. He's absolutely overqualified for the job. Is he a Rus- Russian asset? I don't know. Just asking questions. This back and forth, of course, turned into thousands and thousands of comments uh, on, on Twitter. And almost everybody believed these were real quotes from Tucker Carlson, which they're not. I mean, this is I, I think you read it and you you should be able to tell that. Uh, but this is such uh, this is what's such a big problem with Twitter. First of all, you have people who who just live to troll others and to just go out there and lie about others and try to smear their character. You don't agree with Tucker Carlson on Russia. Fine. Uh, is, is that a big deal? Just say you don't agree with him. Post something that, that disproves whatever he's saying. Lying about him and trying to smear him makes absolutely no sense. But the more important part of this, I think, is how many thousands of people, and including tons of blue checks, that popped on after this and believed this was real. Believed these fake quotes were real quotes. Why? Why would you believe that? Why would you believe that Tucker Carlson was questioning the validity of, of what went on uh, in, in Russia and Ukra- excuse me, in Ukraine? Why would you believe that? I, I, first of all, it's amazing because we can't just jump to the idea that uh, somebody is a Russian asset. That's not the right way to talk about this, especially after it's happened so many times. Hunter Biden, the laptop story came out and every single person in the media told me it was because Rudy Giuliani was a Russian asset and this was Russian disinformation. And only now, two years later, are they admitting the opposite is true. Uh, Joe, by the way, HunterBidenLaptopCase.com. Let's say HunterBidenLaptopCase.com. You're going to love it. Uh, but look, you have this situation where people jump to a Russian asset and then people uh, look at this and say, hey, this must be a real quote. I can't believe Tucker Carlson would say that. Throw him off the air. He's a Russian asset. He's a spy. Well, who is at fault here? If you believe this nonsense, if you believe a guy on Fox News is going to go on and be a Russian asset on television, I mean, why would you believe these quotes are real? Why would you believe it? It's because you want to believe it, because you want so desperately to believe that he would say these types of things because it would prove your point. Well, he didn't say those things, and the point was not proven. And that's why Elon Musk is hopefully here to save the day. Can we agree on this? Uh, Elon Musk has taken a a big, fat stake in Twitter. We talked about it a little bit yesterday, and now he's going to be going on the board of directors. He's going to, he's teasing significant improvements. This is what happens when you got billions of dollars to throw around. I want to be, I should be the richest person in the world. I do really cool things with it. I wouldn't build electric cars. Uh, sorry about that. Probably wouldn't bother with the spaceships, even the flamethrowers, but there'd be lots of cool stuff out there. I think, you know, you wouldn't even imagine what Taco Bell would do with their menu if I had multiple billions of dollars. It would be incredible. Incredible. Uh, Elon is going to try to fix Twitter and at least help make it a less insane place. And judging by what we've seen over the past couple of days, he's got his work cut out for him in a big way. But we do wish him well. And this is, by the way, one of the, one of the things I like about this And only a few people can do it. But like this is around all of the debates. This is around the should we legislate big tech? Oh, no, we should build our own thing. He's just like, I'll just buy the one that's already there and I'll just make it better. (laughs) This is what this is why I need to be a billionaire. If there's anyone out there that wants to donate several hundred billion dollars to me, willing to accept it, make the world a better place. Might not be a better place for you, but it'll be a better place for me. And that's the most important thing. Um, Stacey Abrams is, uh, maybe she could be one of the people donating because she's become very wealthy. Isn't this surprising? Isn't it surprising that Stacey Abrams has cashed in on this situation where she lost a, a race to be governor and then never conceded it? 
Isn't it weird that she's made herself rich off of this? I, for one, am stunned by this development. When she ran for office last time, she had a net worth of one hundred and nine thousand dollars, which, hey, isn't nothing. But, you know, you get some equity in a house, maybe a 401k. Eh, you know, you got a little bit of cash. OK, one hundred nine thousand dollars. You know, not too bad, not too but not like super wealthy. Now, her net worth is three point one seven million dollars. We learned this from state disclosure uh, disclosures filed uh, last month. And now. She gets to talk about income inequality from the only position where it makes any sense to do so. When you got seven figures behind you, that's when people talk about income inequality. Income inequality only becomes a real thing when you get to exploit a bunch of people who have a lot less money than you and, and ask them to look at you as a savior. You will come in and save the day because you are so utterly important. You are the one who are standing there to stop the evil billionaires like yourself from exploiting the poors. That's you, Stacey Abrams. Can't wait to see how this race comes out. And I, I, I find it very difficult to believe she has a chance in this environment to win that race. Now, you never know. We always say this. We give you the disclaimer every single time. The Republicans should win big in 2022. However, never, ever overestimate uh, the Republicans and never underestimate their chances to screw things up because they can do it very easily. And they've done it over and over before. They may very well do it again. And before we go, we have a new entry into the competition to make everything racist. Everything is racist. Every thought you have is a KKK dream. Everything is racist. White supremacist extreme. Ah, yes, every single thing is racist. And we have a new entry here. Apparently, marijuana is racist. I don't mean the drug marijuana. I mean the name marijuana for the drug cannabis. Marijuana, that is a racist term, according to uh, dopey Governor Jay Inslee, the failed presidential candidate and all around zilch. Uh, He has decided (laughs) that the word marijuana is pejorative and racist. And uh, he is going to uh, get rid of it. He's going to strike the word marijuana from the text of all state law. Because when words get bad, these same people will tell you, don't burn books. Whatever you do, don't do that. Don't say gay. Well, this is an actual don't say marijuana law. That's what this is. Don't say marijuana. Why is it actually racist? Well, there was a big narrative here among the uh, left that it was racist because immigrants were blamed for uh, the influx of marijuana a while ago. The idea that the word marijuana is racist, I just think it's nonsense. Marijuana is just the Mexican word for the drug cannabis, said Isaac Campos, a professor of Latin American history who has studied the story of weed. Campos said stories about smoking marijuana leading to madness and violence didn't originate in the United States. They were first printed in Mexican newspapers, and it was the Mexican government that ended up outlawing the drug first nearly 20 years before the U.S. did. According to Campos, the more complete story of the word marijuana is a story about the influence of Mexican culture. He believes banning the word would erase that history. So banning marijuana seems to be racist, but I don't know at this point. The truth is apparently everything is racist. Everything is racist. Every thought you have is a KKK dream. Everything is racist. White supremacist is the stream. You'll be humming that tune all night long, and it's pretty embarrassing when you sing it out loud in front of other people. Trying to buy or sell a home in these times can be challenging. That's why you need a real estate agent that you can trust. Realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go to find that person. We've told you this before. And I can't, I can't stress how important it is. We have people, thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are living in California, who are living in New York, who are living in uh, Illinois. It might be you. Maybe you're in Michigan. You're thinking to yourself, I gotta get myself out of this place. First of all, it's cold. And second of all, have we seen the way the governor is running the state? I need to get out of here. Tons of people are coming uh, south in particular to get out of these environments where they were restricted, where their businesses are constantly opened and closed and taxed to death. 
And that's understandable. But when you come to a new area, you might not know anybody. You might not have a good connection. You might not know a real estate agent that you've been working with for many, many years. Realestateagentsitrust.com does all the work that you can do and more to really walk people through. We're talking, I've talked to real estate agents who are in this program who have had multiple hours of in, uh, interviews and back and forth and checking all the facts. And I mean, the screening process is really extensive and it's not one you could do on your own, honestly. Realestateagentsitrust.com is a place to go to find the best agent in your area, wherever you're going, wherever you are, realestateagentsitrust.com. There's a story that's been going on in the last few days and I, I just can't get over it. I can't get over how Louis C.K. won a Grammy. I don't understand. I, wh- Every once in a while, one of these stories shakes my understanding of the world here. And Louis C.K. is a guy who, first of all, I think he's really funny and uh, I think deserves a Grammy. I mean, his, this special that he won for was really, really funny. That's how I used to think these things were decided, but I gave up on that a long time ago. The fact that Louis C.K., after going through this Me Too thing that he went through, where he... I mean, it was reported, at least, that he never did anything without the consent of the other person. And what the kind of spin on it with the Me Too thing was that uh, he should have understood that the female comedians that were with him uh, did, were uh, underprivileged in this power structure and couldn't say no. Now, I... I don't know women like this. Uh, maybe they exist, uh, but uh, I think women are pretty much in control of their own decision-making process and can say no and walk out the door and would and <laughs> in every circumstance that Louis C.K. described. So uh, that's a whole different story, though. He never had this sort of rejuvenation that, like, for example, Aziz Ansari had, where he people kind of said, oh, he's a Me Too guy, let's get him out of here. And then they were like, wait a minute, we probably went too far with that. It just seemed like it was a bad date. Um, and Aziz Ansari came back out, and he did specials, he's on Netflix, blah, 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 blah. It's like with, with Louis C.K., he never had that comeback. He'd, none of these specials are on Netflix. He's selling them on his own website, and he wins a Grammy. At the same time, Marilyn Manson, who is accused of much worse things than Louis C.K. ever was, was also up for a Grammy nomination uh, along with, with his, on the Kanye West uh, CD. How is this happening? What is going on here? People were like, oh, well, a wh- of course a white artist would still get, a white male would, would, wouldn't have to deal with the Me Too stuff. I don't know. Bill Cosby's out of jail. For ab- <laughs> Bill Cosby's out of jail. Aziz Ansari's on Netflix. Louis C.K., as far as I know, he still doesn't leave the house, except to film specials. That's pretty much his entire gig. A very bizarre, bizarre thing. We need to figure out what is at the bottom of this, because something very strange is going on. They said basically like, ah, well, we're just going to, uh, we're not going to look at their history. We're just going to judge on their merits. Wait, what country is this? What year is it? That's not supposed to happen anymore. Understand how this all works. Okay, it's supposed to be about narrative, not about merit. Okay, so here's what happened. Remember the Coinbase Super Bowl ad? Uh, Basically, they had that floating QR code that just bounced around the screen and had people look at it and then would get them to sign up for Coinbase, right? It's kind of a new thing. And you see a QR code, you you don't know, it's not explained, you kind of want to scan it and see what the big deal is. Well, someone hired 300 drones and flew them into the sky above Dallas and made a giant QR code. I mean, look at this thing. It's actually incredible. Uh, It's a huge QR code. And if you use your phone to scan it, you actually got something. Well, what did you get? Turns out it was uh, the night as it was going into April Fool's Day. And when you scanned it, all you got was a link to the Rick Astley video never going to give you up. They rickrolled the entire city of Dallas. That it, first of all, I don't know if that if that is worth it, but let me try the uh, let me try this here real quick with the code. Get the pop up. Does it work? Oh yeah. 